morning, good day, good evening, uh, wherever you are. My name is Francis Guesquier. I'm the practice manager for the urban development and DRM uh, practice of the World Bank in East Asia. I'm happy to be back at this uh, fifth session this year of uh, the Cities on the Frontline speaker series. Um, it's actually been a year since we started this speaker series, so we thought that we would invite back to our first speakers uh, to the series to talk about their experience over the this past year and how they're planning the recovery. We'll have an additional speaker to um, add to that perspective, which um, uh, is Duncan, who's been accompanying us uh, through the process. Lauren will introduce the speakers uh, in a minute, but before that, let me remind everyone of the intention of this speaker series and the ground rule for the conversation today. The purpose of this uh, webinar is to open, is to have an open and honest learning conversation between practitioners in cities and government and partners supporting these entities. Uh, the calls are not on the record and we ask that you not attribute any comments made today or question asked uh, to the speakers unless the material are available after the call or you have the person's express permission to do so. We're thrilled uh, at the response to this webinar, like uh, most of these um, cities on the frontline speaker series. We have close to 300 people registered for the call today. So to facilitate this discussion, we ask you to ask your question in the Q&A function uh, of the of the WebEx. Uh, please, that the session will be recorded as well, uh, and we will distribute the PowerPoint presentation uh, next Monday. So you'll have the material uh, that is presented today. With this, I'll pass the screen to Lauren, who will introduce the speaker and today's topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis, and it's great to have you back with us. Uh, I have to say it wouldn't quite feel like the one year anniversary session uh, without co-hosting with you. So it's good to be doing this uh, together. Certainly a year ago, we didn't think that we would be reflecting so many of the same challenges again. And we're going to hear more about that tonight. Um, while we've been talking about the opportunity for a global reset, Harnessing this moment uh, to exploit different kinds of opportunities to invest again, to stop behaviors or stop practices of investment that we were not happy about, that weren't sustainable or that weren't resilient, and start anew. And in tonight's conversation, we're going to hear from three of our very close collaborators, um, chief resilience officer, expert professors, about whether those shifts are really coming to fruition. Um, you know, have we really paused and are we restarting in different ways? Um, and so it's really giving me so much joy to introduce um, people who have really become friends over this time of collaboration. Uh, first, we're gonna hear tonight from Dr. Duncan Shaw, who is a professor of operations and research in critical systems at the University of Manchester. Um, and he is also an honorary professor in the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute, which is based in the School of Arts, Languages and Culture. Um, we'll also hear from Dr. Saini Yang. Uh, for those of you who have been with us from the very start, she was in our first session, Learning from China, and she is a full professor of the State Key Laboratory of Earth Science Processes and Ecological Resources at Beijing Normal University. And she's also the Director of International Center for Collaborative Research and Disaster Risk Reduction there. Um, we are then going to hear from Piero Pelizzaro. He is our Chief Resilience Officer from the city of Milan. He has over a decade of experience in climate change policy and urban resilience planning. In addition to working as Milan Sierra, he's the city lead for Horizon 2020 Lighthouse on Sharing Cities. He's an advisor to the Italian Ministry of Environment, Land and Sea on Urban Adaptation Policy to Climate Change, a prolific writer and speaker. Um, so welcome to you, Piero. So now I am going to turn it over to you, Dr. Duncan Shaw. Uh, please 
the screen is yours. Sorry, thank you very much. Can I check that my slides are visible? Yeah, thank you, Francis. So I've been asked to look back a little bit as to what sort of work we've been doing with the Resilient Cities Network over the last year, and also to look forward and to look ahead and to look and think about what recovery might look like. And in the university, we've been thinking a lot about recovery, renewal, and how that can be used to build resilience and developing local um, guidance um, to support um, municipalities in thinking through some of the really tough issues that they've got. And so David Powell and myself have been doing a lot of work in developing a framework. And what I'm hoping to do today is to take you through some elements of that framework. But before I do that, I'd just like to share some of the work that we've been doing with RCN. So we've been um, doing a lot of work in the UK in understanding what response to COVID has looked like, what recovery has involved and thinking also about what renewal um, opportunities um, there are and that exist over the coming months and years. We've been working at the local, the national level and through GRCN, working at the international level with a number of partners. We've been capturing lessons from across the world and many of the CROs have been uh, very generous with their time and have participated in interviews. And we're going to be doing some more interviews to try and understand what has been happening across the world and bringing all of these learning and lessons together, both contributing to the recovery guidelines that you can find on RCN's website, but also developing the Manchester briefing. And Roisin Jordan has been helping with bringing together the briefing. And that briefing now um, goes out through RCN. Um, we distribute it to about 52,000 people. It started almost a year ago. We are 32 issues in, um, well over 350 lessons, trying to bring together lessons from across the world to inform what recovery and renewal looks like. Recently, we've just started a new project, and that project is supporting local um, cities, supporting local government um, across the world. And so very pleased to be working with um, CROs and with the resilient cities, uh, Vancouver um, in Ramallah, GM, and some of my team are just starting off um, looking at Miami and, and working and looking for opportunities there. But all of this is bringing together the information that we think is necessary to go into an international standard. So we've begun that standard, ISO 22393. It builds on the work that RCN have been doing and bringing in our own lessons and, um, and trying to provide some unified um, understanding of what recovery and renewal looks like. By recovery, we mean um, the transactional activities to assure preparedness for the next emergency, for the next wave, and to restore operations. So to take um, the operations back to um, deliver what we need to deliver. And we think that there are certain aspects to that. Um, we think that people and um, cities need to reflect and learn. They need to review where preparedness is and then use that as a way of beginning to restore their operations. We think recovery is different to that. So transactional activities form the basis of recovery, but renewal, sorry, is different to that. Renewal are these transformational initiatives that begin to address some of the SDGs that we see or begin to tackle some of these major inequalities that we have um, that have been laid bare by COVID. Very importantly, the renewal activities are seeking to build resilience in ways that have not before been built. And so whilst we work across people, places, processes to think about how can we build resilience in our people, build resilience in our places, in our processes. We also think about work across all of those three aspects. And renewal is really major significant change of an area, um, taking, um, taking some of the opportunities that are available in response to COVID. The framework um, begins off by identifying some concepts um, for recovery and renewal, and then very quickly advises cities to think about developing a recovery coordinating group. That's a group that will develop and understand what have been the impacts, um, that try to understand what the needs are within communities. It's a group that will develop the recovery strategy. So that will bring together all of the different elements 
that um, the recovery coordinating group thinks should be recovered to, to re-establish preparedness and to restore operations. And then the recovery coordinating group will identify some suggestions for renewal. And those um, suggestions for renewal will be pursued in a renewal summit. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. But um, following all of that and throughout all of that will be the opportunity to identify lessons and to act on those lessons. And so whilst learning lessons is never left until the end, um, certainly it's, it's in this framework to remind us that learning um, both from international comparators as well as from learning from within our own organisations is absolutely central. So just to give you a little bit of insight as to what recovery strategy might include, um, I've talked about the need to reflect and learn about reviewing preparedness and reinstating operations, but there's also the need to start thinking about how are we going to renovate some parts of our system to improve what we do. So these are relatively small scale renovations, but so that these improvements can be embedded. There may be things that we want to return to a pre-crisis state, and so we need to think about how do we return those? What do we need to undo that we had to put in place for the crisis that we don't need any longer? We need to think about what do we want to retain in their current form, and what do we want to resist? So what do we want to stop lapsing back into a previous state just because we've taken our eye off the ball um, during recovery? And then always ending with a positive, but looking at what can we recommend that will create major change in our cities, in our countries, or across countries. And this would be pursued in a renewal initiative. The renewal initiative um, we're thinking about as a renewal summit. This is an opportunity of bringing together very knowledgeable and influential people together to talk about the big challenges that they've experienced and understood better as a result of COVID and what they want to do about that. But it's about starting off in a very positive footing. So in the renewal summits, we're saying, leave behind the memory of COVID. Don't um, align renewal with COVID, align it with something more positive than that. So align it with ongoing strategic agendas that, that have a positive frame the renewal summits should be ambitious and looking for common action and looking for ways in which these opportunities can be exploited, looking for good practice and trying to bring good practice from all range of different sources, international, national, local, and thinking about who needs to participate in these so that they um, are influential, stakeholders are all involved, whether they're political or whether they're other partners that you might want to involve. And many of you will be sitting watching this thinking, well, that's an awful lot of work and we're already extremely tired. And we, we recognise that renewal will be moderated, our ambitions will be moderated by six different pressures that are on us. The pressure still to respond, which is a very real pressure um, across the world. The pressure to recover and do those transactional activities. The pressure to do other major strategic renewal agendas. The pressure of local and national and international politics and how they will change the landscape. Same with funding, local, national, international um, challenges around funding. And then the fatigue of our staff and the, the real and present pressures that are on um, each and every one of you um, in terms of what does the future look like and how can we move from response into recovery and renewal. I was also asked to talk a little bit about some bright spots across the world. And some bright spots um, are effectively the focus of the whole of TMB, which at the Manchester briefing. I just note a few of those on here, um, whether it's looking at traveller communities or looking at positive stories um, that can help us to relieve the mental fatigue of COVID. Um, I won't go through all of these on the slide, but certainly the Manchester briefing aims to bring together some of the, the topics that are less in our foreground and encourages us to think um, just slightly differently about some of the challenges that COVID can present. And I'd really um, refer you to recent um, issues of the Manchester briefing if, if that's something of interest to you. So with one eye on time, um, I'd just like to thank you very much for the opportunity of coming to talk. Um, for the opportunity to partner um, in organising this um, webinar with you. And um, I'd like to hand back to Lauren and, um, and I will stop sharing my screen.
Thank you so much, Duncan. Um, it, it's been a pleasure to see you here and to, to actually have those reflections on the positives and then on how to start learning during crisis and, and continue on. I think there's going to be a lot more to talk about in terms of how different cities have been applying that and the many lessons um, of which you've shown just a few. Now, I want to now pass the floor to uh, Dr. Saini Yang, who, as I mentioned earlier, was our very first panelist um, and really came with a distinct perspective, having uh, lived and observed the response in China before the virus moved on to other parts of the world. Dr. Saini, the floor is yours. Lauren, uh, can you see the screen right now? See my screen right now? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you very much. Um, all right. Uh, first, I'd apologize due to the bandwidth limit limitation. I have to turn off my video, but I, as if you can hear me, that would be good enough. Uh, all right. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, the World Bank Group for inviting me. I still remember like one year ago, uh, so I was back here uh, to introduce uh, the situation in China. Uh, well, so one year after, uh, in general, I have to say, uh, I'm currently in Beijing. The situation in Beijing basically has been uh, recovered. So when the World Bank Group asked me about to share some of the China perspective of city resilience, uh, I'd like to uh, share some of our observations uh, from the Chinese side. Um, well, uh, I uh, probably People still remember, like in last January, when we had the shocking news that some unknown virus, uh, infectious virus, happened in uh, identified in Wuhan, and then uh, I remember in the, in my first presentation, I talked about uh, this. This is Wuhan, located in the right center, in the center of China, uh, one of the most important transportation hub of China, and a popular city with a population of 15 million, and more than five million left Wuhan just before the city lockdown. So, well, that's the situation at that time. And uh, about like 14 months after, uh, here I, I showed the cumulative number of con confirmed cases in China's mainland in the past uh, about like uh, 500 days. And uh, we can see this number that, you know, uh, currently I have to say uh, that the COVID 19 situation is really uh, under control. And uh, uh, most people has already resumed our uh, regular life. Uh, and here we, I, I showed some uh, statistics of the accumulated cases of 30 provinces in, manage, uh, in China's mainland. Uh, here, I just want to show that, yeah, there are, uh, there were several rounds of recurrent uh, outbreaks in China as well. But like each time, uh, this recurrent uh, outbreaks was quickly uh, under control. Um, so for me, um, it's, uh, I, I think this can be called something called like resilience. And like um, last month, I was reading a report from the World Bank um, building urban resilience, and it, wa it was talking about like the, the resilience characteristics, awareness, coping, adapting, transforming. So I was thinking that, you know, maybe when we look back what we have done in the past one year, uh, we actually can find some uh, common features in these four aspects. Um, and, uh, uh, well, I, I don't want to repeat the, most of the content here, but I just want to say, uh, yeah, the, the first thing actually uh, after last January is uh, we established, China established the joint defense, joint control mechanism of the state council for COVID-19. And this is a new uh, trans-sectoral uh, institution uh, all over the, for, for the entire country. And uh, uh, with this uh, joint defense, joint control mechanism, actually we had a lot of different activities. We had rapid academic investigation, very uh, quick information sharing. We had a lot of control transmission uh, uh, measures. Uh, for example, yeah, in the beginning we had uh, the city level or community level, family level, different quarantine um, plans. Uh, and later on, we adopt the dynamic risk assessment and the zoning approach. Uh, 
Um, and also, we try to popularize knowledge of epidemic prevention to the public. Uh, for all these activities, uh, I just want to mention that the, the I think the wonderful part is uh, government is not the major uh, stakeholder who are doing all these activities. Actually, for example, like the, the popularization of the knowledge, it was committed by all kinds of uh, civil societies, uh, universities, schools, uh, community workers. They translate the scientific language to dialects, uh, to graphs, uh, to shows, uh, even uh, make it understandable to people with ear literacy. So I think this type of uh, collaboration really helped us a lot. And of course, I, I, I remember I mentioned this re resource allocation uh, last year that you know, Wuhan is a, is a city with limited uh, medical resources. And just one month after the city lockdown, we had 50,000 uh, new beds built uh, in Wuhan. And uh, uh, well, then in another like two weeks, one week, we had about like 10,000 new beds built. And also the medical team uh, come, came to uh, Wuhan with a paired assistance program. That means different uh, medical teams from different provinces. They all traveled to Hubei province to assist the different cities. And uh, in about like 20 days, we had 40 medical Medicare people travel to Wuhan. So here I see a lot of joint efforts from literary force, from emergency logistics, and from even from commercial logistics. And also there are lots of in different uh, investment in research, in development of drugs, vaccines, instruments. We benefit a lot from this type of joint investments. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there are different uh, protection programs for the vulnerable population, such as the, for the uh, patients in hospitals, senior people in nursing houses, and even for prisons. Um, when I look back all these uh, different activities, actually, I, I noticed that it's a really a collaboration among different sectors, uh, stakeholder groups, among different uh, places. And uh, I see uh, this uh, joint uh, mechanism uh, innovation. So uh, I think this actually helped with awareness, coping, adapting, and transforming. And here I want to show a, a little more examples of this risk assessment and the zoning. And this uh, risk assessment plan is part of our uh, um, a document released by the uh, Joint Defense Joint Control Mechanism of the State Council. And it is specifically um, mentioned that they want scientific prevention and control, they want precise policy in implementation, and want dynamic regionalization and classification for COVID 19 risk. So from there, we have this almost uh, well, it's all the uh, provinces, cities have their dynamic risk zoning system. So they will report the risk every day. Uh, say, for example, here the, the up picture is for Beijing, and here we can see the different uh, risk level uh, in, in Beijing for each district of, of Beijing. And this, I, I picked one in, in January this year uh, when we had uh, one recurrent outbreak there. And here, this is another city in Zhejiang province called Jiaxing. And of course, this is the most recent one. The, all, this is a community level. This is a residential community level. All residential communities seems in, uh, with low risk. So with this type of uh, diversified uh, risk zoning approach, we diversify our control measures and uh, set up different schedules for factory resumption, school reopening, et cetera. And this greatly reduced the impact of the pandemic and the limit, uh, limited the, the restriction in the smallest possible region. Um, another point I want to pick up is the cross-sectoral uh, collaboration. Uh, for example, uh, we have a research institute with the Ministry of Emergency Management. It actually is one ministry responsible for workplace safety and the natural disaster, but it is also a member uh, institution of the Joint Defense Joint Control Mechanism of the State Council. 
So let's see what they have done. They, in this past year, they, they help with this record allocation of emergency relief support, such as tent, uh, quilt, um, uh, sanitization materials, and also they helped with the insurance, uh, the the safety of these hospitals, and also they guarantee the workplace safety of enterprises that produce anti-epidemic materials, as well as provide local anti-epidemic assistance, such as transferring infected people, transporting anti-epidemic supplies, and if this if they're infecting public venues. So you can see there are all kinds of collaborations in all in all different arena. Well, um, in short, uh, I think the most important lesson uh, we identified from the past year is we we really had the scientific guidance for all the control measures in this recovery, and also the systematic approach is really important. This all government all society approach, I think this is one key component in our recovery. And of course, uh, as mentioned by Professor Duncan in his uh, slides, the determination to come back is really laid a very solid base uh, for consensus of the entire society. Uh, with this, I finished my presentation and hand over to Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saini. I think it was very enlightening to see that really specific data-driven approach uh, it was not a, a blunt instrument to, to create lockdowns, but rather one that was very nuanced and um, determined by the, the situation on the ground. And very inspiring words to end with uh, around the cross-sector collaboration and, and that determination. So certainly words that we must continue to live by. Um, I now want to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Piero Pelizzaro, who is coming to us from his office in, in Milan. Piero. We can see your screen, but we, yeah, yeah, sorry. we can yeah. hear you. Here we go. Yeah, sorry. I was... Now you can, you can hear this screen, right? Can you hear me very well? Yeah, perfect. Sorry. Uh, hi, Lauren. Thank you very much to all of you to be here again after a year. And uh, we were joking before with Lauren. And we say that after a year, we're supposed to be, we were dreaming one year ago that we should, supposed to, everything we should be uh, finished and already focused on the recovery somehow. And then, um, in the in the restart but after a year we are still in the middle of a pandemic at least in italy we are working hard on getting better with the vaccine plan we are still here but at the same time we have more impact and more need to adapt to the new situation and to look forward to what could be the recovery starts so let me start sharing what as we learn this is the timeline for what we have lived over the last year it was a funny story when we were drafting this presentation with the colleagues. One of my colleagues sent me an email and say, oh gosh, drafting this email, I realize how long it has been that we are uh, closed, how long has been the discussion and how hard it is to keep going uh, on, on all this uh, situation. But Milena started to work on the adaptation strategy uh, with still March, uh, just a few days after we were offered, uh, suddenly uh, start thinking what should be the next. In April, uh, we have launched a participatory process to identify the adaptation strategy that we have to uh, implement uh, after the first lockdown or at the summertime and uh, start thinking what should be the need of the city. Then we go through the summer and during the summer, the European Commission and all the member states have identified a design, the approval of the next generation, uh, the next generation that is including two mainstream of funding, the reactive, so the immediate uh, funding for the re for restart, and the long-term uh, investment that is the, the recovery and resilience facility fund. Over this, the, the autumn time, uh, together with my colleagues, we start thinking and drafting uh, the local recovery and resilience plan that has to be uh, integrated in our ongoing activities because as a public administration, uh, we are still, even over the last year, we always have to focus and deal with the uh, ordinary uh, uh, activities. And now we also the extraordinary activities that we need to thinking and looking at. So after this time, we have started looking at the adaptation action and strategy uh, for, for the city. And we have identified nine main pillars of the adaptation uh, assumes. 
Uh, we work on rhythms and timing. Uh, so how we should maximize uh, the flexibility of our life and our, our public services. The mobility, how we should diversify the mobility supply, but also because it should be supposed to be uh, uh, reduced movement around the city. Work on the public space and the, and, and the well-being. So how we can reconquer the space for leisure and sport. And let me just focus on well-being. I remember last year when it was March and April, there was a conversation ongoing about how is it the relation between the air pollution and the COVID. And we were all thinking that the air pollution was one of the vector and was one of the, of the reasons. Let me say that after a few studies, we can didn't really, we, we have, didn't see that there is a strict connection, but there is something that we should learn for the future, that if an, a population is already exposed to some health or a respiratory disease due to the air pollution, it's pretty clear that a pandemic could be affect more, uh, more stronger than the others. So working on prevention, working on, on the greening and the resilience of our urban space, it's not more uh, an option. It's even not an option. It's mandatory to work on, on this aspect for the future. Digital services, we have to look how do we need to expand and uh, is it the access to the digital services? We start working on services in the neighborhood. So we have redrafting some of our thinking, uh, looking at the 15 minutes walking cities uh, culture uh, that is one of the most effective, uh, impactful, uh, in, uh, one of the sector was more uh, impacted by, by, the, uh, by, by the pandemic. Uh, the economic activities, we, so we start working on innovation and inclusion infrastructures, housing, public works, how do we should simplify the procedure to speed up also the, uh, the recovery activities related to real estate and collaboration and assistance. How we should recover the collaboration speed among the different categories and people. Uh, over April, you can see here on the map, we receive in a month more than 3,000 proposals uh, were submitted by the citizen of Milan. And then what was uh, super, uh, super cool for us that uh, one of the main, uh, all the main activities were related to the pedestrian space. So how we should uh, enlarge the zone 30 kilometers per hour uh, area, so to reduce the speed, how we should increase the pedestrianize, uh, there is pedestrianization of, uh, of our public space, but then even public lane, uh, bike lanes, bike sharing, and um, urban green. So a lot of our community and people were asking uh, that we should improve the capacity to re they bring back the public space to people instead of cars. And that was really inspiring. And part of this, uh, uh, of this proposal were, uh, were implemented by, by us. So we work really with a bottom-up approach on this. So one of the first elements that it's quite uh, a challenging for us was to rethink uh, the timing of the city. And we have started uh, with a different, with a uh, consultation with a different stakeholder. So we have now uh, redesigned uh, the time for public administration, for example, we extend the time that the people like my colleagues and the others could uh, come in the office. We have started thinking what is the timing of the university. It could start only after 10 a.m. and all the commercial activities. And this, uh, this plan, uh, it's, uh, it's a plan that has been done for this time, but we will keep going even after because we believe it could be helpful also to reduce the congestion in general of the city. We have work on Strada Aperte project. The Strada Aperte project is the open street project. Uh, we didn't have the number at other cities, but we have we proposed to get 50 kilometers was last April of new bike lines. At the end of the years, we got uh, 61.7 kilometers and lines of new bike lines, and we will be we will have 111 kilometers to be concluded uh, before the end of April. And this is. Uh, linking with a, a widening of the sidewalks and extension of the zone of 30. And this is process that, uh, that was what we were saying over the last few months. It's, it was possible because we decided to scale in and to speed up uh, an action that was already implemented even before uh, the COVID. So that will give, give us the chance to uh, speed up and make this uh, more, uh, more, 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 more rapid than, than before. The other, <laughs> we have work on the Piazza Aperte, so it's the tactical movement approach. Why? Because there was this need of physical distance that has the co uh, physical distance. And then the, the number that we have achieved over the last three years is quite impressive because we start with a few, two or three in 2018. Last year, we realized more than 10 new uh, Piazza Aperte open square, especially close to what was uh, 
uh, needs in terms of school and, and other elements so to uh, make more safety also uh, the open the reopening of the school and then it's uh, it's quite important because it is always coupled with other elements in this piazza pet as ping pong table bicycle station so how we should integrate different services in a, in a new uh, in a new public space we have worked on uh, on the uh, extending the outside space for commercial activities and bars uh, we had we got more than 2,000 commercial activities requiring us to get more there uh, the open space there was a simplified procedure uh, for the summer time that was an extraordinary one but then it become ordinary one so we decided to keep this as a, as a new uh, opportunity for the city to reconquer uh, and to make our street a more livable street than only a parking slot uh, we have worked with the collaboration assistance. That was quite impressive. Also, we got on the three main um, uh, action: the mutual aid fund. With the mutual aid fund, we have supported uh, different kind of uh, activities from the commercial, but as well, we also have uh, tried to integrate the food poverty, the energy poverty over the time. We work with the food aid system together with a. Uh, uh, and so a, a network of, uh, of other collaborations like the Red Cross, we have worked with the, the Bank Alimentar Lombardia, the Caritas and Brazil, so the Religious Foundation and the Bank Foundation all together. And we have created a permanent hub to distribute food uh, to the low income population and the one that was more vulnerable uh, to, to, the, to the pandemic. And then we have worked with Milano Ayuta, that is uh, an extraordinary uh, branch of people and volunteering that like, mean, uh, was guaranteeing assistance, collaborative services, and grocery delivery to the other family. And uh, so that is uh, another important step for us. Uh, since then, that was the adaptation strategy, how we have to adapt the city. Then we have start working on the recovery of the city. So uh, the next generation you identify, I was saying before, the two main drivers, the, the recovery resilience facility and the react you. We have adopted a, a transversal approach. So the coordination uh, was under the city manager. It was identified environmental transition and the city resilience department has the one the, the coordination uh, of this work. But we have identified three main uh, three main drivers uh, of the of our future recovery plan: equity, digital transition, and environmental transition. As you can see uh, here, there is the list of the department. There was, we are coordinating, but this is a work that is at the orchestra of, Milan, of the city of Milan is making this real. There was more than 200 people engaged to identify action. And, uh, and the output we want to create is a cross-cutting, inclusive and integrated comprehensive proposal for the cities, because it's now the time to uh, take the opportunity to rethink and to reform the city. So, Yes, we have identified six main uh, areas then going to the opportunity. We look at the sustainable mobility, so how we should drive and, and speed up uh, with the uh, transition to the full electric uh, fleet vehicles, environmental transition, looking at uh, uh, like the green and blue infrastructure, social inclusion, school, culture, and digital. Uh, there is no health here, which because people will say, why well, you are not investing in health? But city administration are not in charge of any kind of uh, health policy or action. All these are in charge of the national government and regional government. So what we can do, and was the driver of this, that we need to work on precautionary and prevention measures. So to get a better uh, built environment, more clean, more sustainable, more livable, it's the way how we can contribute to the health of our, of our community as a measure. And someone will going to benefit from this because they're going to save money uh, for, for this, but uh, we are uh, looking at, uh, at the, the good and the wellness of our population. So here is my last slide, but I want to uh, look at, uh, at this distinction. Even if it's the recovery and resilient facilities is looking forward I mean, to 2026, the react to this is the main topics we have decided to work as the react to with the first element. So we have strongly decided to invest on the green economy and the circular economy uh, as the first element to recover uh, the city after the pandemic, because as well on the energy efficiency and the retrofit, because we have made uh, different calculation evaluation uh, on the impact on uh, direct indirect impact of our action. And we have seen that uh, the fast track uh, um, activities to implement for recovery start the, the, um, the economy it's uh, working on sustainable resilience and circular economy 
And I cannot disclose all, all our action because at the moment they are still under evaluation uh, of the national government. And uh, we don't want to get uh, into the, uh, uh, let's say, political arena debate that is ongoing in the country at the moment, because our first element is to recover it fast and to guarantee a brighter future for our, for our communities uh, in the next few years. Thank you very much for the presentation and give me the time and the chance to speak. Please, Lauren, back to you. I'm actually going to turn it over to Francis, who's going to start us off with some questions. Thank you, Lauren. A lot of questions come to mind listening to the presentation, a couple of them in the Q&A sections. Uh, and maybe we can start with uh, maybe uh, some of the, the concepts that were used in the recovery. Dr. Saini, you mentioned uh, a concept which is a pairing program in China, which has been used indeed in the past, I've heard of it, and, and specifically in the case of the COVID-19, which is an interesting concept, uh, I think, from which other countries could learn from. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on what it is, how it's been used in the past, and then in the case of the COVID-19, and how you see the concept evolving in China? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you for this question. I'm sorry that I didn't uh, elaborate this concept in my presentation. Uh, this paired program or say pairing uh, assistant program uh, actually is not new from this COVID-19. Uh, it was uh, invented or started from the Wenchuan earthquake happened in 2008. Uh, well, that was a, a catastrophic earthquake. Um, I think more than more than 80,000 80, people died in uh in that uh, earthquake event and huge lands was uh damaged uh well we were in deep trouble as a time for recovery and then the, the state council uh came up with this paired assistant program idea and the essence is to ask the the less affected province to support one heavily affected county uh in in the Wenchuan earthquake region. And with this uh, program, uh, it solved uh, uh, important limitation in resource for recovery resource. Uh, the province provide money, provide, uh, provide uh, technical assistance, and even provided uh, reconstruction labor to that heavily affected county. So, no, that's why uh, I think that's one very, very important program help us to recover uh, in three years right after the Wenchuan earthquake. So for this COVID-19 case, we reuse this idea. And that's because in the very early uh, stage of the, the COVID-19, we had a huge uh, shortage for medical resources in Wuhan and in Hubei. We, wish, we were short of materials, we were short of uh, Medicare, Medicare people. So basically same idea, like each province will provide several medical groups from different cities to assist Hubei and Wuhan. Uh, of course, this turned out to be quite successful practices uh, because as I said, this is really a, a collaboration uh, among people, among different places. This actually at least a temporary resolve this uh, resource shortage issue. Also, I think right now, if I look at it, I think this type of uh, care program is also important psychologically because this gives people trust and give people confidence. Um, then all the public will believe that, yes, we will be able to handle this. Everybody are willing to help. And we did. So I think in this way, this also contributes to the consensus that uh, we determined to come back as soon as possible. So for me, I think this is quite important to move. Uh, I'm not sure if I answer your question, Francis. You did. Thank you. There was just a, a little window, but now I'm going to move back to uh, I thought it was interesting to illustrate this concept, but moving back to the topic at stake and uh, back to 
Duncan. Duncan, you, I really like your uh, concept of renewal. And in fact, I really like the idea of local renewal summits. Uh, are some of these summits already being planned, organized, have any taken place? And how would you see this unfold? Uh, how would you organize it uh, in the UK? Can you elaborate on, on that topic? Sure. Yes, we're in the process of talking to one of the local authorities um, about what their renewal summit will look like. And I think one of the um, hesitations that cities have at the moment is what is the role of the political officials in those summits? So during response, there has been some um, challenges in the UK about involving officials in the response because um, the response has been led by um, the blue lights, has been led by those with statutory duties. But when, and so the political um, officials have um, not quite found their um, position for that. But in recovery and in renewal, you can really see the, um, the enthusiasm for our elected officials to get involved. And so one of the issues that we're thinking about is how do we involve them through the renewal summit, recognising that perhaps that is the place to bring um, politics in, or perhaps that's the place not to have politics, that actually we need to um, come together um, more in a co-production sense, so involve communities, involve citizens. And I really liked um, what um, Piero was talking about in terms of involving citizens in that way. So um, it's something that um, we are looking at doing um, over the next month, um, and um, yeah, and and so, but I could obviously talk more about its design, but maybe I'll just leave it there for now. Well, no, actually, I think it'll be interesting to um, el elaborate on the design. I mean, my sense is it's the role of politicians to create the debate, to uh, engage with the community, to actually decide on on what to do. And after you, you talk, maybe we can then move to, to Piero and ask how much of consultation and engaging with the population. Of course, it's very difficult in Milan with, with the lockdown, but do you have any plans when things start opening up to try to engage a little bit more uh, with the community on the ground to get a sense of where they want to see things going? But first over to you, Duncan. So, um... Sorry, in terms of um, what we think the, the renewal summit should cover is obviously looking back to see well, what actually happened and making sure that people understand or, or have similar experiences um, and that those are, are aligned, especially around what the existing visions are. So if the visions are um, misaligned, then there can obviously be some difficulties in developing strategy around those. And what one of the important parts is what is the ambition for um, for renewal, so I think Piero has talked very clearly about the large ambitions that they have in Milan. Um, the some of the meetings that we've been in, people are just so tired to start thinking about renewal and think about those multi-year projects. When you've got people who have in the middle of response, also thinking about renewal of other activities, so there needs to be some aligning around um, what the ambition is. Um, looking to see what are the ongoing strategies that are already being um, pursued within areas and making sure that renewal both complements those but also doesn't um, try to reproduce them so that there is alignment around um, what they're trying to achieve and really trying to bring together different parts of the system around pursuing those. So we don't think that it's necessarily a resilience partner's job to um, to implement renewal because they will be um, activities that will cross a whole range of different departments within government. Um, but we think that, um, that the, 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 there is a, a risk perhaps that the opportunities of renewal will be overshadowed by the fatigue and the desire just to move on. Piero, you want to elaborate on that topic? Well, you know, we uh, after the first consultation, uh, we have done another initiative in September, October. Uh, we done uh, it's named Fare Milano. Uh, it's meaning uh, doing Milano. Let's say how we should do it. Uh, we start with uh, a few meetings. Really, it was uh, one or two were capable to have audience because 
uh, the things where uh, we need to work on the stable, we need to get closer to the people, we need to understand how the people are perceiving after a year of digital life and so on. So the idea is, yes, to get back. Also, we are time on uh, election uh, in the next, over the summer, because we're going to have the election, the general election in the city uh, early October. But, but, but the thing is, uh, should we have a, a, an initiative as a, like a dialogue, or we should have a plan when we should engage community in rethinking the city since the beginning? So we are now focusing on understanding how we should collect the interest of the population among some of the possible solution and action and start the dialogue of making this real and not only a conversation and change somehow. Uh, because I think there is a lot of need of people to be closer together and to help each other and to make uh, real changing uh, in the city. Uh, it's a challenge and it's, uh, as Duncan will say, we need to, to, to integrate and to work collectively in this sense. So, uh, I think we we do it. Uh, we we want to do it, uh, but as I said at the beginning, we are still in the middle of the pandemic. So we have stopped saying that what we're going next. We are thinking about the big action, but uh, about the face-to-face -face initiative. We are now keeping more. Um, you know, uh, we will say <laughs> we say later on. Yeah, when Duncan talks yeah. about fatigue, I can definitely yeah. uh, see. Uh, what I mean, I, I cannot actually imagine what you guys are going through in Singapore. We have been blessed with a very short uh, lockdown, but uh, talking to colleagues in Europe and the US and the rest of the world, uh, we realize that it's it's uh, still ongoing and hard. Maybe we can turn again to uh, Dr. Sahini. In the West, we have this vision of all decisions in China are top down. You know, it comes from the Communist Party. When I traveled in China, uh, mostly for the World Bank, I was surprised to see how many consultative mechanisms there are at many levels. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on, on, on those mechanisms and maybe on, on whether how they've been used uh, in, the, in the case of COVID response and maybe the recovery? Sure, a little bit. Um, uh... I, I mentioned that in uh, in early February, we our, our state council set up this uh, joint defense joint uh, control mechanism for COVID nineteen, and in China, as we we actually uh, for each community, we have a, a community level joint uh, control joint prevention mechanism for COVID nineteen. That is to say, uh, for each community, we will have a a community committee, uh, and this uh, community committee is composed by uh, different people from this community, like retired uh, workers, volunteers, uh, even by, um, and, and for example, I'm also a member of our community, uh, community committee. And uh, of course, we will have some instruction from the city level and also based on the feature of a community, uh, this community committee can propose uh, different activities. For example, like what kind of information we want to release to the residents in our community, right? Uh, what kind of uh, uh, like inspection process is needed for this community? Um, and uh, uh, what, what, who should be responsible for which areas uh, this infection process? So all this detailed work was discussed and uh, uh, implemented by by this uh, community level committee. So I think this is uh, this is one way that uh, this uh, top down approach can be successful because it's not merely uh, not solely top down. It actually is, yes, we have some instruction from upper level, but also the community will make their decision and uh, tailor their execution based on the feature of their community. I think that's um, one important feature in our practice. Thank you. Imagine that it also lets information trickle back up on things that work 
and don't work. How big are, are these local communities? Like you're on a committee of a community that's um, so many people. This depends on this depends on the size of the community, because <laughs> you know in China different cities, uh, <laughs> some community has maybe like uh, like one hundred thousand people. Some have like ten thousand people. So this community committee, uh, usually they have a core group about like ten people, but also for this joint control joint. Um, prevention mechanism team, uh, they have totally different range of number, like from um, several, like several dozen to several hundreds. It depends on what is the size of this community. Hmm. Thank you. Lauren, you want to take over? I was going to ask a quick question, actually, following on the, the topic of consultation. We, we actually heard in some of the cities on the frontline sessions that moving things online in some ways democratized consultation and gave people the chance to participate in processes that they wouldn't have normally participated in. Sometimes people who are caregivers, people who are disabled, right? Or, or maybe um, women or maybe people who were not confident enough to go um, or didn't have access to transport to go to certain places to make their voices heard. So I, I was actually going to ask, um, Piero and, and also Duncan in the research, have you seen that to be true and have um, governments actually increased the level of their ambition around consultation um, in any ways during the pandemic? Want me to go? Sure, we can come to you first, Piero, and then to Duncan. Uh, um, yes, the, the, it looks like that, uh, that there is uh, more to participation, but at the same time, there is uh, as well. Uh, uh, there was at the beginning, in my opinion. After a while, now, uh, after years of long term, I believe, depending from city to city and to country to country, all this digital life uh, uh, is not anymore so attractive as it was before. Yes, we have more time to communicate, we have more time to engage people and easier because we can get access, but at the same time, I think there is a kind of a content to, uh, to go for a digital consultation, digital life. People want to get back uh, or say they are, uh, and they hear voice somehow. And on the other end, uh, there is this, this good benefit. It's, a, it's also have another, another consequences. There is too much information. And with too much information, people get confused. So we have seen with the vaccine, for example. So yes, you can get more closer for the engagement. At the same time, all this information that everyone could share, want to share, want have time to share on the social network, we create a more uh, confusion in terms of uh, knowledge and know-how. So I think it's uh, yes for the first time, for the first of the question. After a year, we get bored and third. All this communication is creating more confusion, and we need to get back on the clear understanding, which is the reality. Just to add to that, I think that um, it, obviously the response to COVID is such a technical topic, and the recovery from it is such a huge topic that it is difficult for members of the public perhaps to grasp all of the different aspects of it and to be able to. Um, make informed decisions on absolutely everything when it's such um, a, a complex um, range of issues and we're getting so many different messages depending on which news program or which newspaper um, you turn to. So I think that whilst um, members of the public are perhaps being consulted more, I think that they've been consulted on a topic that is just so complex that um, we've got to make sure that the consultations are ones that they can be um, that they can be informed on and be able to respond to. So at the moment, we have a consultation out about vaccine passports and whether those vaccine passports would um, help business or whether they would hinder business um, in terms of uh, there would be certain expectations um, around how businesses might operate if people did have those passports. Now, asking a member of the public around vaccine passports, they might want it because they want to be able to go on holiday overseas. However, there are a whole range of other issues that um, might be very difficult to predict unless you're a complete expert in all of the different aspects of those passports. 
So whilst um, some of these consultations are absolutely right and um, are, are seeking to do an excellent job, they're also being done on a scale that is incredibly rapid, and so people are not able to make um, very well informed choices. Um, and hopefully that, that comes down to pace and hopefully over um, recovery, we will have more opportunity to perhaps slow things down a bit and take some of the more patient approaches to consultation. Thank you, Piero. Thank you, Duncan. And, and thank you, Dr. Saini. Unfortunately, I have to start to bring the session to a close because we are at time. This has been a very broad ranging discussion um, as we knew it would be because we're reflect reflecting on a year of dealing with the pandemic, of response, of recovery, of considerations of renewal. Um, so there, there are no easy summary points in, in this one, but I will just take a stab at three themes that I heard a lot from, from you. Um, you know, the first was really on the collaboration that was triggered by this unprecedented challenge and that we saw different groups coming together, working together across departments, uh, across different cities, uh, certainly in this forum, across many different countries and political persuasions as well, um, because we realized that this, this issue is really quite, quite bigger than all of us. And it's created this incredible opportunity. Um, and I think there was an important reflection here uh, that I heard very clearly, and in particular in the response to the last question. And that is that the broad ambitions are great, but you actually have to be quite specific in how you tailor both your consultations and your interventions so that you're not overwhelming people and that you're actually designing for, for success and that you're not getting derailed from some of the plans you had before. I think, Pierre, it was very interesting to see you have your two parallel plans there. Of what was the ambitions of Milan in terms of overall resilience and what the ambitions are now in terms of COVID response and recovery? They are similar. They're in some places deeper, in some places changed slightly, but you have somewhat stayed the course and used this as an opportunity for retrenchment around those, those ambitious goals. So I think it's been a really inspiring panel. I think um, there will be follow-up questions I can see in the chat from, from the participants as well, and we will post your presentations. Again, I wanna thank you um, for, for the wonderful presentations tonight and invite everyone to please join us again in two weeks. We will be having a presentation on low carbon and resilient real estate. What is happening? Uh, to our city real estate sectors to our built environment in the future. And we will have representatives from Real, which, which is a group that works on affordable and resilient housing and um, the Jakarta Property Institute, as well as our chief resilience officer from San Francisco. So again, thank you to Dr. Saini, to Piero, to Duncan uh, for joining us from all over. And thanks to everyone who joined us tonight from, from our cities and from the World Bank. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.